In this episode of the Appalachian Food Evangelist, we're going to make a holiday feast that will knock your socks off. And we're going to be talking to some of the folks that grew the food. It's going to be good. I'm Dale Hawkins. I'm a chef, a farmer, and a man on a perpetual quest for the best in West Virginia food and food ways. And I love to share. I'm the Appalachian Food Evangelist. Welcome to our winter edition of the Appalachian Food Evangelist. We're at the historic Adam Stephen home in Martinsburg, West Virginia. And every year here at the Adam Stephen house, they do a colonial Christmas that's just wonderful. Tonight we're gonna to be serving black walnut maple scones. We're gonna create a country ham that has a cranberry glaze. And in addition to that, we're gonna have sweet potato risotto and green beans. We're gonna finish it off with a rustic apple tart. Yum. Everything that we're gonna to prepare tonight includes West Virginia specialty crops. And you guys hear me talk about specialty crops all the time. Well, what do I mean by that? Specialty crops are defined as fruits, vegetables, tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture, nursery crops, and floriculture. I'm here with farmer Bob Tabb, who's growing popcorn, which is one of the new specialty crops in West Virginia that we're talking about. And, and we actually had some popcorn pop today for stringing of the Christmas tree. And I understand that you're growing several varieties, Bob. We do. We, um, we've been growing popcorn about 17 years now. And it's not something that's new to agriculture, but West Virginia growing popcorn is becoming more popular. Know that when you actually dry the corn, you have to leave a certain amount of moisture in there. What's that for? We do. These are some, some ears that were popped earlier today to pop popcorn on the cob. Mm -hmm. The key to that is moisture. There's an explosion that takes place at about 400 degrees. And popcorn, unlike dent corn, is totally sealed on the bottom. So the key is we get this between 13 and 14 percent moisture. Then we package it so it doesn't get more moist or drier and that's how it pops. This variety right here is a mushroom type for stringing mm -hmm. on, on the tree that was done today for the holiday season. But this is also used for the coating. So if you've ever eaten Cracker Jacks, this is a type popcorn, but we grow numerous varieties and lots of colors and lots mm -hmm. of textures. It's a specialty it's, crop. It's beautiful corn and, and I really can't wait to see what it looks like on the tree. One of the specialty crops that we're going to work with are tree nuts. Tree nuts would include hazelnuts, pecans, walnuts, black walnuts, and the American chestnut, the Native American chestnut, which was nearly wiped out with a blight a hundred or so years ago, but there's a lot of restoration efforts trying to bring back blight-resistant chestnut trees. If you can imagine a, a pig or a hog that was raised and fatted on chestnuts, how wonderful that would taste. It's just incredible. So much of the food that we eat today is fattened up on corn, uh, commodity products, and we've, we've lost that flavor profile that we would have gotten in food 50, 100 years ago. So it's so important. Now, what I'm going to do with that pig is it's being turned into a ham. We're going to make a cranberry glaze to go on it. Really simple recipe. It has five ingredients. Water, cranberries, sugar, cranberry orange finishing sauce, and maple sugar. Very easily, all you're going to do is add water to a pan, and I'm using about a half a cup. I'm gonna take fresh cranberries. They're gonna go into the water, and it's gonna simmer with sugar, about a half a cup. And then we're also going to use a little bit of maple sugar just to give it a nice maple flavor. We're going to stir this and then we'll let it simmer for about 10 to 15 minutes. What we're looking for is a nice little syrup. Uh, the cranberries will start to just pop and then we'll glaze the ham. So we've allowed the cranberry glaze to simmer. Uh, we've reduced it by almost half. And at the end, I finished it off with a little bit of cranberry orange finishing sauce that I picked up at the Bolivar Farmer's Market yesterday. I'm gonna go ahead and set the glaze aside and we'll score the ham, glaze it, and get it ready for baking. So why do I wanna score the ham? Well, when you score the ham, and what does scoring mean, 
That means we're actually going to take a series of cuts on the ham like this and then crosswise like this. And the reason we want to do that, we want those flavors to go down into the ham. That's where that cranberry glaze is going to come in and it's going to kind of permeate that meat as we roast it and then we'll baste it throughout the baking process. So by creating these scores, it's allowing that flavor to go in. It's also allowing the ham to cook a little more evenly. You want to make sure when you're doing this that you have a very sharp knife. Now, <clears throat> I use a carbon stainless steel knife simply because it keeps a, a nicer edge. Most knives these days are created from high carbon stainless steel um, in which you have to sharpen them so frequently. This one I can just take on a steel, uh, get the, the metal flex realigned and it's, it's pretty good. Uh, I don't have to sharpen it as often. So, I'm ready to do the ham now. I'm going to take this glaze, I'm going to spoon it, I'm just going to spoon it over the ham like this. If you have a pastry brush it seems to work pretty nice but if you don't just kind of spoon it onto the ham. We're going to put this ham into the oven for about two and a half hours on 350 degrees. Every 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, we want to take it out, just baste it a little bit with our cranberry sauce and then pop it back in. Now back uh, 200 years ago, typically this would have gone in a, into a Dutch oven and into the fireplace. And that's how they would have roasted it. With modern technology, we don't have to do that. And while we're waiting, I'm going to make a rustic apple tart and maple walnut scones. Okay, so the first thing that I do when I'm making an apple pie is making, making the pastry that goes with it. So I'm gonna start with two and a half cups of flour, uh, a teaspoon of salt, and one cup of unsalted butter. And this is where, if you had the gadget, a pastry sifter would come in very handy, but um, what I'm looking to do is actually cut this fat into the flour so that it creates little pea, not pea size, but just tiny, tiny, tiny layers of fat in the pastry. And that's what makes your pastry flaky. A lot of people will use solid vegetable shortening or a combination of vegetable shortening and butter. My go-to pastry includes all butter. And I just love butter. I love it so much. What I'm looking for is um, a coarse texture to the flour. And so it's kind of mealy looking. Once I get that far, I'm gonna add a half a cup of cold water and it's gonna pull the dough together into a, to form a ball. Now there's a lot easier ways of doing this. You can use a food processor, but you have to be careful not to overwork the dough because that blade of the food processor runs so quickly that it will actually heat up your butter. Once I've formed the pastry, I'm gonna put it in the refrigerator and let it uh, just rest basically for about an hour-ish. Uh, it'll be fine in a fridge for up to two days, but after it comes out, it's gonna be a little bit firm. So I wanna loosen it up just so that it's a little bit easier to roll. And you do that just by moving it around on the board, kind of pushing it down, contorting it a little bit here and there, and that'll just make it a little more pliable to roll. So when you're ready to roll it, you take a little bit of flour, you sprinkle it on your board, and since I'm making a rustic apple tart, or apple pie, or whatever you want to call it, it's still a pie, but it's in a tart form. I'm going to take the dough, press it down into a disc, and then I'm going to begin rolling the dough. So when you roll pie dough, you want to have that perfect circle, push out, pull back. I'm going to give it a quarter turn. And the reason you do this is so that as you roll it, it maintains that round shape. So once I go two turns like that, I'm going to do about a, an eighth of a turn and keep that same process going. 
as you as your pastry kind of incorporates that flour into itself, you want to just keep reapplying flour so that it doesn't stick to your rolling surface. Obviously, it's taken me several minutes to do this, but once I have completed it, I want to take a little pastry brush and just get the excess flour off the pastry. The reason I take this excess flour off the pastry <clears throat> is when you're transferring pastry from surface to, let's say if we're going into a pie pan, this obviously this is going to be a rustic form, but when you do that you want to make sure the excess flour is off of it because flour typically, if and I'm saying this because we're doing pastry and pastry is heated in a, a pretty high temperature oven. So typically if you have flour on that, it's going to burn. It's going to create brown spots that you don't want. I'm going to be using a half sheet pan or a cookie sheet that some people call it with a little bit of parchment paper on it. This is what I'm going to create my freeform rustic tart on. I'll transfer the pastry from the rolling surface onto the pan and then completely open it up and now I've got it ready to fill with my apple filling. Before I make the pie filling, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the apples. We picked them up at Orr's Farm Market, and I did a little interview with Katie Orr Dove over at the market. Hi Katie, what can you tell us about Orr's Market? Orr's Farm Market is a family owned and operated farm market. It's an outlet for us to sell the crops that we've been growing as a family since 1954. Cool. In addition to apples and peaches, what other specialty crops are you all doing? We also have sweet cherries, strawberries, blueberries, black raspberries, grapes, pumpkins, Asian pears. Agritourism has played a, a big role in you expanding your business. Can you tell us how? Um, we've just been listening to what customers have been asking for for years. And as our area became, becomes a little bit more urban, um, a lot of people don't have their own home gardens anymore and they want their children to come out and experience what life in the country, having a garden, picking berries is really like. So I came today to get apples and apple cider. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how important apples are to this region? They're very important to the region, both economically and historically. It's a huge part of our history of the area. Um, you know, we've been around for years and less and less orchards are in operation now. So I think it's really important that those of us that are here share that story mm -hmm. with the customers. And economically, you know, our business probably has up to 250 people working here during the busy season. And we're producing over 500,000 bushels of apples every year. So it does employ a good many employees. So I'm gonna make some apple pie tonight. And I typically will put two to three kinds of apples in my pie. So I need a couple of good baking apples. Can you recommend a couple for me? Um, I like to mix two or three as well. I really like the Mountaineer York, which is very um, special to our region as well. We're one of the only orchards that you'll find those at. Um, very tart and crisp. I also like to mix in a stamen and possibly a Golden Delicious. Mm, nice combination. Mm -hmm. So now I'm quartering and slicing the, the apples. I've added sugar, about a cup, and ground cinnamon. I'm gonna to toss it just until it coats the apples. Bring the pastry back to me. And then I'm just gonna place these apples in a kind of a random circular design. You can heap this up as high as you want to because what's gonna happen as it bakes, the apples are gonna kind of lose some of their volume and so it'll sink down a little bit. The thing I like about this pie, I don't have to worry about if it's perfectly round. Once I have all the filling in, I'm gonna take the sides, press them up around the apple filling Kind of push it all together and now it's ready to bake. We'll preheat it to 425 degrees. It'll bake for approximately one hour and we'll have a really terrific apple pie. I was talking about specialty crops earlier and in particular we were talking about tree nuts and how important they were to the early settlers. 
black walnuts are one of the varieties that was used and I'm going to use that to make my maple walnut scones. So <clears throat> I have four cups of all-purpose flour. I'm going to add one cup of unsalted butter, a half a cup of granulated sugar, a tablespoon of baking soda, and a teaspoon of baking powder. And again, this is the same process that we used when we made pie dough. Uh, we're looking for that same texture that we had, the coarse mealy texture. We're going to add some walnuts. I need to chop them fairly roughly. Okay, so we're going to add the chopped walnuts to our flour mixture. We'll bring it back. I'm going to add about two ounces of West Virginia maple syrup. I'm going to add about a cup and a half of whole buttermilk. I'm not going to put all of it in yet because I don't want to make I want to make sure that my dough is not too wet. <clears throat> so I'll pull that together, check for wetness of the dough. I'm ready to shape this guns. I'm going to pull a piece of parchment paper in. I want to tip the dough onto our paper and then I just want to shape it into the resemblance of a circle. We need a little bit of flour and this will just help us shape it and prevent the dough from sticking to our hands. So this literally is similar to a biscuit. A biscuit you would use vegetable shortening. We're using all butter here, but you have the same texture that you would with a biscuit. Don't tell that to the English because they get really serious about their scones. I'm going to cut it into 12 slices. We're going to bake this in a 450 degree oven for about 25 minutes. Uh, if you have a convection oven that works best, if not it may go a little bit longer than that. But once it comes out, we'll glaze it with a little bit of maple um, syrup and we'll sprinkle some chopped black walnuts on it. We're making our green beans and I'm going to start with an onion, fairly small dice. We're going to add that to the two tablespoons of butter, my favorite ingredient. The butter has already been melting. And then we're going to take just a small handful of beans. And again, I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. You'll have to scale it up, um, you know, depending on how many guests you'll be serving. We'll do a rough chop of the green beans. Add that to our onions. Stir, stir, stir. We'll add about a half a cup of chicken stock. If you're vegetarian, this would be a, a place where you could substitute vegetable stock. And then we're going to let that simmer for about seven minutes. While it's simmering, we'll get ready to prepare our sweet potato risotto. Now we're ready to make our sweet potato risotto. When you're making risotto, it requires a, a very special kind of rice. It's called arborio rice. It's a short grain rice. And um, there's risotto is actually called risotto because of the technique that you use. So when you're making risotto, the first thing that you want to do is put a little bit of fat in your skillet or your saute pan, and you actually want to cook the rice in the fat. So you're not looking to cook it fully, you're just wanting to get it coated in that fat, maybe get a little bit of toast on it because that's going to help develop the flavor of the risotto. 
Now while that's going on, I'm gonna actually take a sweet potato that I got from Bob Tab yesterday, and I'm gonna dice it um, into a small dice to go into the risotto. Now I'm just making a couple of portions. The actual risotto that I'm making now is called the restaurant method of making risotto. And the reason it's called that, you can actually cook it to halfway and then let it cool. You kind of spread it out on a sheet tray, you let it cool, and then whenever you're ready to make risotto, you just take it out of the fridge, kind of pop it in the pan, and you reconstitute it with either chicken stock, a little bit of cream, whatever kind of liquid you want to use. <clears throat> so, I'm just going to do a, a, about a quarter inch dice of sweet potato. I want to get enough in there to give it some texture. Make sure you mind your rice in between. We're starting to get a little bit of color on the rice, starting to smell that nice toasty fragrance. And we're going to go ahead and add your sweet potato. This is also a place in which you can add other aromatics like onions, garlic, if you want to put a little celery in, you can. I'm just trying to teach you the, the basic principle of making risotto. So we'll keep that moving around. Now I made a little blend of cream and chicken stock. Now when you make risotto, there's an actual method that you want to follow when you make it. Experts at making risotto will tell you there's only one way to do it. You have to have your stock hot. and You ladle your stock in as it soaks up the liquid. You get continue ladling the stock in. I'm not as old school when it comes to making risotto, but I do know that you do have to allow that liquid to absorb into the rice continue to stir it, and it's just this long process, probably about 10 to 15 minutes, of adding stock, let it absorb into the rice, add more stock, and continuing to stir it. That's when it's going to give it that creamy uh, texture. You have to be careful not to overcook it because you want that al dente, that, that firm bite to the tooth um, that's so characteristic of a good risotto. So while I'm finishing this up, uh, I want you to know that we're actually going to go to a Christmas tree farm or a tree farm and we're going to cut a tree with a, a really nice family and we're going to come back here, decorate the tree and have some hot cider and some mulled wine. We found this uh, West White Hill sweet spiced wine that we're going to pair with it and for the kids we're going to have some hot apple cider. We're at Ridgefield Farm, and I'm talking to Alan Gibson, the proprietor. Hi, Alan. How are you, Dale? I'm fabulous. Welcome back. Thank you. Alan, can you tell me a little bit about what you do here? I know there's a lot of different things, and it looks like you do a lot of agritourism. We do. Um, but specifically as it relates to the holidays. Well, this is, uh, this is really a fun time for us. We call our farm uh, your farm experience for every season. And this season in particular is, is a, of course, a lot of fun. Um, and we've had generations and generations of, of people out here. One of the reasons why I think a place like our farm is so uh, exciting for, for younger kids is because it's an actual real kind of place where they actually have a hands-on experience. I mean, they can touch and feel a tree, they can see it growing in the ground, they get a saw, they can figure out exactly what happens to it. You know, so much of what we have is we just see the end product and we don't know where it came from. I mean, of course, you know that about food. People still don't understand where their food comes from necessarily. Right. So agritourism is really at the core of our farm. Um, we're not a large farm, and so we don't sell uh, products commercially. We sell directly to the consumer. So uh, our entire business is families and, and individuals coming out and picking things and, and um, enjoying the the ambiance of, of wandering around our, our farm. I'm always talking about specialty crops and I know Christmas trees happen to be one of those, right? Talk well, they that. certainly are. Of course, I know most of the, the specialty crops you talk about are things you eat. Right. But in, in this case, no, Christmas trees are definitely a specialty crop. And we grow three or four kinds of, of trees here that are 
specifically uh, tailored to be terrific Christmas trees. Trees that have great color, that hold the, the needles well, and that are strong enough to hold ornaments. A lot of the people come up and say, oh, I don't want to cut a tree, I'm afraid, you know, it's, it's green and, you know, everything. Of course, we grow these trees to be cut, they're crops. And think of, think of a tree, before someone cuts it down, it's probably been here for eight or nine years. Maybe contributing. Contributing oxygen. And yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible value to, to, uh, to the area. So there's an economic impact, there's an environmental impact? It, absolutely. The Appalachian Food Evangelist is made possible by a USDA Specialty Crop Block Grant, the West Virginia Department of Agriculture, and Wild Wonderful West Virginia. Hashtag go to WV.